Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In the message he sent to the Rimini meeting, a few days ago, Pope Francis invited us all, and I quote his words, first of all, not to lose touch with reality. As a matter of fact, we should love reality. I believe that scientific research, which is again the main subject of today's meeting, when it is true to the value and limit, uh, which is uh, implicit to the method, well, scientific research, I believe, is one of the expression which is most original expression of us as uh, truth-loving humans. We should never lo lose track, lose touch with the reality. It is love for reality. It is love for facts that prevails in the, at the harsh uh, researchers of scientists. The Pope would qu quote it also Don Giussani stating that the process to get to the true meaning of reality implies we should live our existence without any foreclosure, without any denial, without any rejection of anything. And I believe that the scientific method is a certainly a um, sphere where we need that approach. Science to proceed requires that we shall not neglect any of the elements that are essential, so to the essential to understand a problem. We shan't forget anything that might play a role. What we have to acknowledge is to identify what is essential and meaningful, and once a fact results to be um, essential, uh, it shan't not be denied, it shan't be neglected. Uh, and I believe there's an important educational value, therefore, connected with science. So the fascination with science and research is to grasp the, meet, the meaning, the connection, looking at the plethora of phenomena that we can witness in the natural world, excluding nothing. It is a charming quest, it is a difficult journey that takes us from the clue to the meaning, or as the title of our meeting says, from the detail to the whole. In this process, through this journey, we're going to be taken by by three main uh, scholars, and most important scholars, three main key players in the scientific research. We'd like to share the deepest motivation for this love for uh, truth, as it is expressed in this uh, specific uh, process uh, towards um, uh, the objective of uh, scientific research. We have most distinguished scientific researchers uh, with us today. The state of the art in the different uh, scope of knowledge, scopes of knowledge that deal again with the three completely different eras. We have somebody who's a scholar in astrophysics, somebody who's an expert in mathematics, and somebody who's an expert on paleontology. Well, I believe that again, we picked delegates or um, distinguished guests coming from three completely different fields. And uh, I believe we can still understand that there's a common feature there's a strong, deep motivation that connects all scholars uh, in the quest for reality, in finding out, again, what hasn't been discovered so far, uh, basing ourselves on facts. Over the next two days, we're going to have another dialogue with some tenth of mm, different scholars uh, at international level in, in San Marino further to discuss this subject. 
A conference will be organized indeed on the roots of motivation in science and knowledge. What we're interested in is taking you aback to uh, elicit wonder, to find uh, the motivation that urges us to go beyond what is already known. I'd like briefly to introduce our three guests. Well, I have to be brief in the interest of time because if I had to say all whatever I achieved, we would be here forever. Indeed, I uh, uh, can boast a quite a relevant background. At my left, um, Professor Chris Christopher M.P. Chris is an astrophysics. He's a full professor at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Arizona. He's also the uh, vice chair of the department. He has published over 170 specialized papers on different subjects connected to the world of astrophysics, from cosmology, observational cosmology, to galaxies, to quasars, uh, to um, extrasolar planets. He received financing from NASA and from the Ni National Science Foundation for uh, mm, over 20 million euro. And uh, Chris is also a leader in uh, scientific education. Indeed, uh, he did a lot uh, in that field. He was awarded 12 prizes for the teaching of science. And uh, he holds an online course with over 17,000 people. He was, was uh, vice president of the American uh, Astronomic Society. He's been uh, also appointed as the professor of the year at the University of Arizona. And he's written many dissemination um, papers on cosmology and astronomy. He's also wrote, written a novel that unfortunately hasn't been translated into Italian yet. And he also published five very successful books. And here again, there's just one book that was translated into Italian, and, that in the and it is The Living Cosmos. But anyway, there are two different books that Chris uh, is writing, and we sincerely hope for that they get translated. So thank you very much for being with us, Christopher. Qui alla mia destra, Yves Copin. At my right, uh, Yves Copin. Yves Coppens ha ottenuto il suo dottorato. Yves Coppens got his uh, um, PhD in paleontology at the Sorbonne in Paris. He has been the first uh, to establish a relationship between the relationship existing between the development of the environment uh, and uh, the development of the human species at a time when nobody had um, anticipated the importance of uh, this relationship. He has been chair of the uh, modern anthropology uh, and cha he's also cha was a chair of paleontology and paleoanthropology uh, uh, in France. He's guided many um, study trip uh, throughout the world, especially in tropical Africa, in Chad, Ethiopia, uh, in the Afar Desert, and in Asia as well, in Indonesia and in the Philippines, in China, Mongolia, Siberia, and. Throughout his career, he's collected uh, a huge number of fossils, uh, scientific data on uh, hundreds uh, of uh, hominids, and he recognized uh, three n new um, uh, elements in six uh, species, and, no, and he actually is uh, a world record. He's published some thousand uh, papers, both scientific and dis disseminative articles. He's a member of academic uh, associations in nine different countries. He was awarded prizes in another eight countries. Now, I'm not going to list them all, otherwise we're going to be here forever. And uh, he's uh, uh, got a PhD in um, honoris causa in the four different universities. He has uh, many schools were named after him. Even an asteroid was named after him if that wasn't enough. And there's something that has never been uh, said public, publicly. The asteroid was two kilometers in length now to say that apparently was a further detail that was required. 
But there was another thing that I meant to say, and that happened very recently, and I believe this is being said publicly for the first time, and that is that Yves Campin uh, has been invited just a few days ago to be part of the Pontifical um, Academy of Sciences. Sulla destra, sulla mia destra. At the far right, Monsieur Laurent Lafargue, Professor Laurent Lafargue. Laurent, as if are not here for the first time at the meeting, and we're extremely pleased to have them here. And we hope that in the future, Chris can, will come back. Laurent got a degree at the École Normale Supérieure in France. He got his PhD in 1993. And he was a researcher at Sierra Neves uh, in the uh, equipe of arithmetics and algebraic geometry at the um, University of Paris, number 11. Ever since the year 2000, he has a chair. Uh, at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Paris. And in 2002, uh, he was mm, awarded uh, the most important recognition that the mathematician may receive, uh, i.e. some kind of Nobel Award for Mathematics. You know that there's no mm, Nobel Award for Mathematics. There's this prize, which is called uh, the Fields Medal. And he was awarded the Fields Medal, again, the most high-ranking recognition in the field of mathematics. So Laurent was awarded that for proving that uh, there was a correspondence at, with the Langlands, uh, which is one of the most important enunciation in the Langlands program in the theory of uh, numbers, algebra, and analysis. This program that has become one of the most important open issue in mathematics. Over the last 40 years, uh, many mathematicians have been studying that. Laurent himself is still working at it. Thank you, Laurent. Now, I'm going to ask each of you a different question. So I'll start with Chris. What I'd like to ask you, Chris, is that in your experience as an astrophysics, as a scholar in astrophysics, uh, you've dealt with a wide variety of subjects in the field, again, of astrophysics, from observational cosmology, you studied the black holes at the center of galaxies, as well as quasars. And then astrobiology, such as uh, exoplanets. And across the board, you scored uh, quite relevant results. What I'd like to ask you is as follows. Is there a central interest that you perceive? Is there some pivotal interest uh, that combines together all these different spheres, all these different interests uh, that range so widely? And on top of that, and based on your experience in the field of scientific education, what do you think can trigger the interest of young people in uh, scientific discoveries in astrophysics, most specifically? Just been to the nearest rock in space, the moon. This cost an enormous amount of money, and it was so difficult, we have not been back for nearly 50 years. This is the limit of our direct exploration. But we have the tools of the scientific method observation and theory, and we can use these to project ourselves into strange situations. 
We can take ourselves to the center of distant stars and understand them. We can inspect the atmospheres of planets like the Earth that are trillions of miles away. We can venture to the edge of black holes millions of times more massive than the sun. Yeah. And we have even surfed the microwaves left over from the Big Bang that created the universe. In fact, we have taken our understanding to within one trillionth of a second of the Big Bang itself. All of that is the power of science, of remote sensing. Let me talk about the power of physics and mathematics. There are a handful of physical laws, only four, that explain everything we think we can see in the natural world. Not only that, but these forces seem to be linked and are examples of one underlying single force. We don't yet understand that true single force of nature, but that is the frontier of physics as we speak. And the underpinning of all this physical theory is austere but very beautiful mathematics, of which Laurent can say more. The success of mathematics and simple physical laws to explain the natural world is still a little bit of a mystery. It implies, for example, that the universe is fundamentally a mathematical entity, and yet we think mathematics is a creation of the human mind. So we are led to even deeper questions about the nature of reality. On the subject of education, I would like to say that everyone is born a scientist, whether you become a scientist or not. Every human baby is born curious. It's in our DNA. There is even a gene associated with exploration and taking risks. Other animals may be intelligent, I think they are, and they may be self-aware, but we are the only animals to make mental models of our world and to alter our global environment. So I think everyone has the potential for science. Unfortunately, in some it ebbs over time. Perhaps the teaching in the school is not so good. So we can have our natural curiosity malnourished at a young age. And that, of course, is the job of all of us and parents in particular to not let that happen. To get people into science, all we need to do is speak a common language put up the welcome sign, use engaging language, and invite everyone in. Thank you. Vorrei chiedere adesso a Eve. Let me now ask to Eve about your research. You invite us to look at our origins with your research with a different approach, with a, perhaps a complementing approach when, if compared to an astrophysics. So Chris provides us with a cosmic scene, whereas uh, you identify the clues left by the hominids uh, on the Earth, our, our ancestors. What do you think? 
are the open issues uh, when it comes to paleoanthropology? And these new frontiers that are being shifted, uh, are they connected to the first boundaries that actually draw originally uh, you to this science? Has something changed in your motivation, in your relationship with the subject matter uh, during those years? And if so, how did it happen? Well, quite that's a number of questions altogether. It's just not just one. First of all, let me say that my discipline that is connected with the origins of mankind and is fully integrated with the studies on the origin of life and the origins of the universe. So to speak, I am not that far removed um, by the field of study of the gentleman sitting on your left. And by the way, I greatly uh, appreciate uh, that uh, we are studying things that are maybe 14 billion years apart. In these 14 billion years, uh, we see the development of life on Earth. Uh, less than 5 billion years, um, life started and the mammals started uh, 200 million years ago, and then the primates started 70 million years ago, and as for mankind, just 3 million, 3 million years ago. And that's very little. In other terms, the history basically is very much the same. <clears throat> There's a continuity. Uh, uh, and uh, whenever new inventions are developed, whenever something new I is created by nature, uh, and those are wonderful uh, and uh, takes us aback. There's a correlation um, amongst all things wonderful, and uh, I am greatly, I'm in great wonder and awe before all that. Now, on to my motivation. Well, sadly, my motivation has shifted and changed over the years as a young boy. Uh, I was obviously uh, attracted by prehistory, archaeology, uh, paleontology, geology, and uh, a combination of the above, basically. And there was uh, some curiosity that was perhaps connected uh, to the presence within my family. I'm talking, for example, more specifically about my father. My father was a physicist and was a researcher. And his research certainly uh, um, played on me and influenced me. I meant to do something different. I didn't do with nuclear physics as my father did. I wanted to change a subject. I wanted to deal with paleontology, but still, uh, I was dealing with research. And when you're young, uh, you want to discover new things. You've got this curiosity. You want to become a scientist. You want to become a scientist that make discoveries, uh, um, discovering new interesting things, uh, wonderful things, uh, things that are greatly impactful. And uh, this aspect, this small bit, uh, is basically what triggers it all. Uh, this is the beginning, but then you start uh, carrying out research. I carried out excavations, for example, and that enabled me to have access to more complex worlds, as it were. An idea um, started to get framed about uh, different cultures, uh, uh, about mankind. And so you start off as a young boy, then you go uh, through maturity, and as you get more mature, you have to deal with more philosophical issues. Now, I'm no philosopher myself. I know nothing about philosophy. But what I mean to say is that uh, when you work as a scientist, when you are a scientist, when you 
raise questions on the origin of mankind, on the origin of life, of the earth, of the universe, of the unity. When you study the universe, and for 14 billion years, the rule have been very much the same in the universe. So basically, when you touch upon these things, you have necessarily to deal with philosophical issues. So certainly, over the time, my motivation changed. Anyway. I still feel greatly connected to basic research, to the object of research, to the small fragment uh, of bone, for example, or um, to the fragment of ceramic, to the pebble that you can find out in your excavation, and that can provide you with information on uh, the, the way that piece was used, the fragment, um, what it was made of, uh, uh, how old it is, how it was used, who has created it, and so on and so forth. Vorrei adesso chiedere a Laura. I'd like to ask Laura, and we're entering the world of mathematics now, which is a science of its own. I'd like to ask you, Laura, what is it that motivates a mathematician in research? What is it that motivates you? in this um, fascinating world of mathematics. I think there is some kind of um, value, something good behind all this, something we can call beauty, value, attractiveness, something we can uh, hardly find a name for. But without this, a mathematician would probably not find the energy to go on. Laurent was telling me before that at some point he got to a solution to something which is really important. But immediately after you find a solution to something, you have another obstacle to overcome. You need to be tough. I'm not a mathematician, but I suppose that you can have such an approach only if you are deeply and strongly attracted by something. Only if there is uh, something unexpected that supports you in this path. As Chris said, mathematics uh, is a, a possible language for the human mind. Perhaps without this attractiveness, uh, mathematics would not have developed at all. There is a sort of uh, rewarding uh, correspondence every time you have the grace to make a further step forward in mathematics. Could you comment on this? Is this true? Do you think we can give a name to this something good underlying mathematics and this search in mathematics? And what's the relationship of this something good and other good experiences we have as human beings? Thank you. Well, the first thing I have to say is that I really like this question. I like it very much. It's a unique question. Thank you for asking. What do I mean by this? Actually, it's the first time in my life that I hear someone associate mathematics and something good. It's the first time I hear someone use the word good talking about mathematics. Well, actually, combining beauty and mathematics is not something unique, but combining something good and mathematics, it's actually the first time I hear something like this. And of course, this um, intrigues me. When uh, reflecting on this, the first thing that comes to my mind 
is that it is uh, surprising that no one before you has ever said things this way because you know when we as human beings do something it's always uh, to look for our good it's always to look for something which is good for us well we not all of us but a number of us a number of human beings have been dealing with mathematics uh, for many years. And in today's world, there are hundreds or, of thousands of people who deal with mathematics. They are using mathematics in their jobs. What are they looking for? They're looking for something good in mathematics. Let me say, incidentally, that I am really intrigued in um, hearing that you associate mathematics with something good because most people have a negative uh, image of mathematics. Uh, you know, most people have suffered at school because of mathematics. Very often, even physicists uh, or scientists uh, don't like mathematics. Uh, I've seen this in France as well at the Academy of Sciences. They don't say nice things about uh, mathematics. I have a physicist in front of me who says, who asks me, what is good about mathematics? Let me try and answer this question. The first thing that comes to my mind when I wonder what the good thing about mathematics is, is something that was uh, suggested to me by Yves Coppens and what he just said. He said that he wants to always go back to the object. To him, the object is a bone. It's something material. To us, mathematicians, the objects are intellectual objects. They are objects of the mind of a thinking process, something which is very important to us mathematicians is that there are mathematical objects which have a reality that does not depend on us. And indeed, the first good for us, or better, the true good in mathematics is the objective nature of the discipline, the fact that in mathematics you've got objects that you can study and investigate. In mathematics, there are truths which do not depend on us. And indeed, in mathematics, the truth imposes on us in a rigorous and very strict way. In mathematics, we cannot dream of changing the truth. It's not us who decide what the truth is in mathematics. When we say, if we say this, it, you may have the impression that uh, truth is like a marble stone, uh, something which cannot be carved, uh, something which cannot be changed at all, but but to us, um, mathematicians, this is the good thing about mathematics. It's the comparison with a certain type of truth. What we're looking for as something good in mathematics is a comparison with truth. And this truth is something we do not make decisions on. I'm tempted to talk about the transcendence of uh, the truth. We can't change the truth. That's why it's something good. That's why it's a fuel for us. Another 
good thing about mathematics depends on the first one. In mathematics, you have the possibility of understanding. So understanding is a possibility in mathematics. In other words, all these mathematical objects exist independently of ourselves. The mathematical truth is there before our eyes. We can serve it, but we also have the possibility of understanding it. In other words, you sort of establish a link, a relationship, which is rather mysterious, even if we're used to this. There's a link among certain objects of our mind and our abilities. In maths, there is a great pleasure, really a huge pleasure in understanding. And I think that many amongst you have had this experience already starting in primary school. You know, considering even elementary things about mathematics, the theorem of Pythagore, of Pythagoras, or the elementary properties of the circle, etc. Very simple items. And certainly many among you may have had uh, the experience of uh, trying to find why a certain property is true in relation to a geometrical figure. You don't really know why, but at some point in time you understand. And when you understand, you feel great joy in yourselves. What does this mean? It means that this truth, which is independent of ourselves, is something we perceive inside ourselves. We get hold of this truth and we start mastering this truth and this becomes the source of a great joy. This is therefore the second aspect of what is good about mathematics. Now one third aspect I'd like to discuss with you. It's all about the manifestation of the wealth of mathematics. Oftentimes, when I talk to people, and tell them that I'm a researcher and mathematician, well, they look surprised and tell me, well, is st there still something to be discovered and found in uh, mathematics? Well, I do understand that they m may feel surprised because, uh, you know, at first sight, mathematics may look rather limited. The foundations of mathematics uh, are whole numbers, uh, elementary geometrical intuitions, the very simple uh, figures that you have in your mind, the sense of space and the elementary uh, rules of logics which have not changed since Aristotle. When we consider all these elements, uh, well, you may say you can't do you can't really do very much in mathematics with so few elements, but maths has been there for a long time. So people assume that everything has come or must have come to a stop in learning about mathematics at some point in time. We mathematicians perfectly understand that people may feel surprised, but we feel this sense of surprise on a daily basis. We continue searching in mathematics and going deeper into many aspects of mathematics. And to our great surprise, every day what we try and investigate and explore is the source of even greater richness day after day. This is um, a great lesson 
it's something good that we really receive throughout our own existence. We may at some point think that nothing is um, poorer or more arid than mathematics. All other aspects of the human mind may look richer than mathematics. Instead, the poorest of all fields has an endless wealth. So this is, to me, the third aspect of something good in mathematics. Vorrei adesso fare una domanda a tutti e tre. I'd like now to ask a new question to all of you and on that we shall close our meeting. This question is suggested to me um, based on the very heading uh, of this meeting. The first part of the first part of the title of the meeting mm, says to the ends of the earth and of existence and I believe that this tells us about where we're going to to the borders of knowledge and uh, that process uh, through to knowledge uh, is uh, carried about through uh, science so we've heard from three different uh, scientists what is the common feature what is the red thread in their studies, well, perhaps we may say that each of them tries uh, to get to the further end uh, that is still uh, known about reality, this objective reality, that object that can be considered as uh, the, mm, uh, mm, uh, the universe for astrophysics or the mathematical object for the mathematician or uh, the um, subject matter or paleontolo paleontology. Anyway, something objective. So going towards the end, uh, going to the end of the earth and of existence uh, imply that we should get ever closer to this, uh, again, end of the world and uh, uh, that we see before our eyes. So what I'd like to ask you is a comment on that. How can we interpret this uh, sentence, this phrase, the title of the meeting? How can we identify uh, the meaning of our life uh, as scientists? What does it mean to go towards the end? But then there's another proposal that I'd like to uh, voice to you. What about the second part of the title of the meeting? Oftentimes, the science is looked at as if it were some kind of uh, one-way trip towards a vision of the world where the meaning uh, is lost somehow. The more um, new discoveries are made, the more scientific discoveries are made, the less meaning it, there seems to be. So this is what the common sense has it. Uh, this is, again, uh, what we usually feel as if on the way towards uh, discoveries or discoveries after discoveries, uh, we basically understand nature as uh, just a meaningless mechanism. And yet the very fact that we are given the chance to understand, to learn more, to find out more, makes us, uh, it, or gives us the possibility to establish a positive uh, relationship with reality. We can love reality, we can enjoy reality. The fact that getting to know something can be positive, can be good. Well, I believe this suggests that there can be something deeper, deeper than the uh, mechanism which has just revealed a fragment by fragment. So I'd like to invite you all to uh, tell us what uh, the second part of the title of the meeting implies. Destiny has not left man alone. The first part of the question, literally, 
think of our situation in time and space? If you go 100 kilometers straight up, which is closer to you now than Venice is, you will reach the total vacuum and the blackness of space, a place we cannot live. That is the edge of the earth and of human existence. But we have the ability to go far beyond that. We could build habitats on the moon with our current technology and on Mars. We could discover habitable worlds in other solar systems. And we could explore and fulfill the destiny of our curiosity that we've already talked about. What about time? Humans are finite. We will all die, and humanity will probably one day go extinct. If we do this by our own hand, it is our choice. It would be a form of collective suicide, but I think we can do better. We need to mix our science and our technology with wisdom, and then we can transcend these limits. And the goal in all of this should not just be to endure or persist, because all life does that, but to live well and be good caretakers of the planet. The clockwork universe of Newton is dead. Nature is complex, it is nonlinear, it is multi-scale, and it is not deterministic. I believe we understand the world and ourselves through our science and our art. Each creative act is a statement, is a small statement of defiance about the fact that we live in an apparently uncaring universe. Creation is how we add value and meaning to our existence and a little bit to the universe itself. For the last part of the question, I will comment on an experience I've had in the last six or seven years. I've gained a different perspective on this question by visiting northern India every year where I teach cosmology to Tibetan monks. I'm not a Buddhist, but I've learned that the Buddhist tradition spans endless time endless time and innumerable worlds. It's completely consistent with modern cosmology. But that tradition also embraces suffering and compassion as central to our existence, which must be acknowledged as a context for science also, since science is a human pursuit. I believe dolphins and maybe some animals are also highly intelligent but they don't think about their cosmic situation in time and space. That is our unique capability. And our unique capability to do science carries with it a particular opportunity and also obligation. Thank you. Oui, euh, je voudrais d'abord saisir tout de suite. Let me say right from the beginning that there's a formula that has been used oftentimes, and that is combine art and science. Well, art and science are certainly two different worlds, yet those are spheres of human activity, both of them. Science being the description of the world and the attempt to understand this world and its functioning. Whereas art is the intuition, uh, but is very closely related to the above. Art is intuition. Art anticipates. 
science. Uh, as uh, my neighbor was saying, uh, we're bound uh, to address science to try and understand um, fragments of the reality. We're given no options, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be scientists. Art implies us to fly high, uh, or enables us to fly high, and this is something that uh, anticipates the truth which is um, before us. So we reach the same truth uh, ahead of time through art. Well, center, uh, uh, whether it, or periphery, when it comes to research, we usually find a small fragment of ceramic or pottery. We try and understand where it comes from. We might see that it comes from some kind of building. Then we look for the uh, origin. We uh, try to find when it was built. Um, we try to see whether it is part of the first architecture of the world. Uh, maybe it dates back to some 8,000 years ago. And that little fragment tells us how a certain uh, farming population uh, uh, in the west of Europe started off uh, and uh, led the rest of the world that they were powerful. So we started off with a little fragment of pottery, and uh, we found out that the idea uh, or of a society, we identify a specific society. Likewise, again, uh, widening up um, uh, the horizon on the same fragment, we can understand that the, the world is not chaos. Well, After the Big Bang, since we've given a definition to the Big Bang, there is some degree of complexity in the objects. But then, at the same time, there's also some kind of organization. Things, objects are uh, ever more organized and ever more complex at the same time and complicated. Then one day, this inert matter, um, which you know is said to be inert, but it is not inert because it is going to become active, and we shall go from the molecule to the cell, and the cell is a combination uh, of molecules, and that cell will have the privilege to reproduce itself in this, along the same lines, uh, in a, a continuous line, so out of one level, mm, the new level is going to be embraced, and that we can s mm, f finally see something different. And the higher the degree of differentiation, the higher the degree of complexity, the better the deg degree of organization. While at the same time, again, uh, there's a higher degree of diversity. But there are her hereditary laws basically controlling it. So we're faced with a paradox. The life spans throughout uh, the Earth up until the same life for natural reason. will shift from a uh, living matter to a thinking matter. So, thanks to this uh, additional part of uh, brain activities, we're going to have again a higher degree of organization and a higher degree of complexity. Again, the more the diversification, uh, uh, the more the control uh, and the more the degree of freedom as well, the bigger the degree of freedom, but also uh, the greater the responsibility. So once again, in the continuous line, uh, we're going to go one step up. What does this all mean? It means, It means something uh, which probably uh, is better said in French than in, other, uh, the, in any other language. 
in terms whenever there's a sense, a direction, there's a meaning to it. And this is why that I'm always in awe and wonder before this history that get organized in such a consistent way. And that leads us also to expect this uh, subsequent step. As was said earlier on, the human being or the animal know know many things. But men know they know, this being the difference between mm, mankind and animals. So this is the level of self-reflection. Men uh, are as if they were before our mirror. So uh, this enables mankind to reflect upon uh, something else. I'm a scientist. I'm a natural scientist. I'm a paleontologist. And luckily enough, I was given the chance to work on those um, sites where we found indications of the first uh, man. And that happened uh, because uh, there was a weather change that requires some adaptation. And uh, he, animals uh, change their legs uh, when they have to run faster uh, in a dry climate, uh, when they have to run in the um, open extenses. Elephants in certain conditions increase uh, their denture because um, when they have to eat grass, you use you wear and tear your teeth more than when you eat um, leaves. And men uh, change their heads. As for the rest, this is all uh, uh, the change that took place. This little thing, this little change, that in a natural uh, process is uh, going to lead to the animal uh, rather than uh, eating more uh, grass or running faster, will find a new strategy to uh, um, run away from predators. So strategies uh, to flee predators. To so the small level brain is a bit more complicated, is a bit better organized, uh, um, And that additional fragment of brain uh, enabled us to uh, think about ourselves, to speculate about ourselves, to speculate on the world, understand the world, understand the universe, understand the law of the universe, and uh, to go from the small center to a global level. There's always uh, some global level that is to be arrived at because the center of the universe is yet unknown. Is there anything like the center of the universe? We don't know. We don't know whether the universe is finite or not. But brain? started thinking about many things, astrophysics, mathematics, the universe. And it uh, left that small cradle in Africa, in the tropical area, to span over the whole of the world, then the moon, soon Mars. 
afterwards of the solar system, uh, and then who knows, perhaps over and beyond that. We're talking about journeys. Well, those who shall embark on those journeys are not going to be the ones that are going to get back because it will take a generation over the journey. So the people who are going to take off are not going to be the same that uh, land because it will take a generation to cover that distance and this to avoid predators. And this is quite extraordinary. Science is certainly wonderful. I've said that before. And as was said earlier on, we all have a right to all the knowledge of the world. This is a right. We are all entitled to the knowledge of the world. And our job is that of explaining as best as we can what we understand, or perhaps we don't understand, but we have to try and explain at best what we try uh, it can be understood. And it, this is always a great, great pleasure. Thank you. Donc, euh, à mon tour, je vais essayer de. de well, I will also try and uh, react to the two components of the title of this uh, Rimini meeting. First of all, uh, the ends of the earth and of existence. Um, well, this idea of periphery, of the edges, of the ends, is to me something that corresponds to some, something existential. We are all uh, a special people living in a special uh, period of time. We were born in a special uh, place, uh, we have a special history of our own, and we all have the feeling every one of us in his or her own niche to be inside a periphery. A scientist is part of the minority, a small minority of individuals, which is the academia. It may sound also a bit weird in society. We've got um, defects, uh, our flaws, our peculiarities. Uh, we're less used uh, to social relations than the others. Uh, so we are quite special people. If you think about what we do, we constantly live in a paradox. We are committed to the extraordinary adventure of knowledge, the scientific adventure, the adventure of science, which has been ongoing for centuries. Sciences uh, whose goal is uh, truth, is the truth, well, you know, the more they advance, the more they specialize The more we know, the more what we learn is um, very particular, very specific, very small as compared to what is immense. It's um, much smaller than uh, what one can possibly know and understand. As far as mathematicians are concerned, most people, including representatives from other scientific disciplines, cannot even imagine what we do. You see, Chris said it before. He 
presented astrophysics, the black holes, the stars, were well, more or less we know what it's about. Then we had Yves Coppens, uh, who worked at the origins of human life, as Marco explained to us. He worked at the origins of the human species. So we deeply understand what all this means. Marco explained that I've been working at the Landsland program for more than 20 years. We have um, many people sitting uh, here, and I don't think that uh, even two of them may know what this program is about. It would be a miracle if they knew. See what I mean? If you work um, at a specific mathematical uh, project, you are at the periphery of the farthest away periphery. So when I try to think of this uh, word, periphery or ends or edges, another three themes come to my mind which can be exactly the opposite of a periphery. First of all, wholeness, then unity, and the center. Concerning wholeness, you know, sciences have always pursued the dream of um, complete knowledge. In the 19th century, Many scientists uh, dreamed that one day we would have known everything. You know, progress, also scientific progress, was not able to fulfill this dream. I think, you know, this reminds me of a conference that I attended this morning on the place of man in history. Two different ways of seeing destiny were presented. You know, destiny as a sum of elements which are entirely meaningless to us elements which we have to reduce as much as possible. The dream of knowledge and progress is to reduce this destiny as much as possible to a point where you actually don't have any residue anymore. Everything is kept under control thanks to complete knowledge and thorough knowledge. So this is the first idea, the first concept of destiny. The second one is a concept of destiny as something which cannot be reduced, which cannot be eliminated. The concept is that of a destiny coming towards us and giving a meaning to our life, enriching it and providing us with what we cannot find on our own. So this generates a painful experience. We as scientists find ourselves at the edges all the time because of this increase in knowledge. Somehow this experience spoils the first concept of destiny as something uh, that can be reduced. This is um, the great scientific adventure. Reality is endlessly rich and cannot be entirely known. 
the more you get to know reality, the more it looks rich and uh, impossible to control and uh, dominate. Le deuxième, le deuxième terme qui me vient à l'esprit. The second word I have used in correlation with the periphery, with the word periphery, is unity. Due to a consistent expansion in knowledge, we as scientists have the impression of getting increasingly a part of each other. In the 19th century, scientists could understand each other's uh, work. Today, a paleontologist, an astrophysicist, or a mathematician can't understand each other, but not only. Also, within mathematics, uh, two mathematicians from two different sectors can't understand each other. To us, this is also real everyday experience. It's an experience that really we feel as tearing. Where's unity? Can we still dream of a unity within our disciplines and among our disciplines? Well, an answer to this question is in my opinion, this Rimini meeting, yesterday, but also before. Yesterday, I visited many exhibitions, the one on Charles Piggy, the one on Tolstoy, the one on space exploration. Well, information is presented at each exhibition very precise, very specific information is presented. Dates, texts, pictures, photographs are displayed, stories. You know, the curators of these exhibitions have certainly tried to provide the visitors with very precise and detailed information. So you are confronted with this information as you go to these exhibitions. And going from one exhibit to the other, the information which is provided is completely different. So where is the unity? Well, I visited these exhibitions and found a sense of unity in the generosity of people. Those that had prepared these um, exhibitions, especially the generosity of the volunteers of the Rimini meeting. Ce que ces expositions avaient en commun, c'est what all these exhibits have in common, in my opinion, is the search for truth, which underlies all the exhibitions. All the curators of the exhibitions wanted to provide visitors with high quality information in order to, feel, to fuel the visitors' minds. At a meeting like this, covering so many topics, unity is represented by the volunteers, by the people of the Rimini meeting, and the generosity that comes out of all these people and volunteers. Third word that I have used before and that I would like to further discuss with you in association with the periphery. This word is center. So far, I've used, we have used the word periphery, ends, edges, or whatever, as a 
word which corresponds to a painful experience. But if you think about it, this word is a strange one because what we experience as human beings is just a periphery. You know, all our experiences are peripheral. All the people we get to know are unique and special. All the knowledge available to us is special knowledge. They form a minute part of the truth. And since this is the only experience we have, we can ask ourselves, um, how is it, or how can we call all these experiences that are available to us? How can we describe them with the word periphery? If we describe them as peripheral, it means we long for a center. So, and this would be a, an empty desire. We feel an acute desire that all these experiences fill us, but they're not sufficient to fill us. We want the center. The periphery is not enough. Uh, when we become aware of this uh, desire of ours, hope grows within ourselves. It's a very weak hope. That is, destiny has not left man alone. This is our hope. In reality, we can find fuel for this hope. I talked about the wealth of mathematics before. The wealth of mathematics gives us uh, the idea of the wealth of reality. I also talked about the possibility of understanding. Now, we're used to all this. Nevertheless, if you really think about it, it's a surprising fact. If you think of the subject of Eve Copin's work, The Evolution of the Human Species, where you see the hominids surviving for their, striving for their survival like all human beings. Well, you see that the human mind during the last millennium was capable of uh, cultural creativity and scientific creativity which go much beyond what is enough to survive. Let me give you an example. Maybe you'll smile now, but I'm an actor an expert in Langland's program, and I can tell you that Langland's program is certainly not enough to survive. You don't need it to survive. You don't need it, really. It's um, a project or a program among many others. It's among the many things that our mind can uh, enjoy. The fact that there is such a wealth, the fact that we, as uh, small, ephemeral uh, human beings, uh, are able to recognize all this wealth, the fact that 
we are surprised in front of it and can investigate more and more. Now, this fact to me is a sign to support our hope that uh, destiny has not left man alone. Io credo che dobbiamo essere molto grati a questi testimoni perché tali I believe we have to have, be extremely grateful to our speakers they've been true witnesses of science that showed us that a human being explores reality establishes a connection with reality as inspired by a hope, anticipating a good which is yet unknown, but which lies in a promise. And I believe that they themselves, in the very way they presented their contributions, uh, as the professor was just saying, they are showing that this end of the world is something that is what alive within ourselves, uh, the relationship with something which is uh, true that appears uh, for the first time in all the events that could be a scientific discovery but could also be uh, the experience that we live on an everyday basis. The reality has an endless uh, richness to it. We've heard about the wonder uh, uh, by uh, MP that was talking about uh, the cosmic uh, and as Chris said we've heard that mankind is the only one who's aware of uh, his point uh, his cosmic situation about the relationship with uh, the whole in an ongoing quest for truth, a truth that we receive, uh, something very nice that Laurent told us. Laurent told us that, that this truth is something that we are given and that we recognize as such because it is again given to us mysteriously. We can recognize it. So we are surprised sometimes to be key players in this experience of knowledge we are just by um, grains of sand uh, in the universe. And I'm reminded of what Einstein would say, what is uh, uh, most difficult to understand about the universe is that the universe is understandable at all, is that we are uh, uh, given the chance to understand and uh, express wonder before what we see, before what surrounds us. The truth is uh, that the reality does not betray us. Whenever a new level of knowledge is arrived at uh, in all these different ends of the earth uh, that the scientific uh, research is examining and analyzing, new forms of beauty and uh, richness are identified, sometimes also new forms of tenderness with which uh, the creation um, develops before our eyes. Uh, it would be nice for the new generation of artists to be uh, better exposed to the result of scientific research. I believe that what we've heard today makes us understand that the mystery is absolutely necessary for our lives. I believe that physically we need this uh, immensity, this end moving towards something which is a still a promise towards something that is not in our hands because there's always going to be something that escapes us, that is something that we cannot hold in our hands. So let me close with a nice uh, phrase by Dostoevsky, a nice quote by Dostoevsky, who in The Demons wrote the immense, the infinite. 
is as indispensable to mankind as this little planet uh, where uh, the uh, human beings live. Thank you.